Hello and a very warm welcome indeed to Quadriga coming to you from the heart of Berlin and suddenly it seems we are going back to the future. Why? Well, because of fears surrounding US President Donald Trump's announcement that he plans to abandon a decades-old arms control treaty with Russia. The concern is that by scrapping the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF as it is known, Moscow and Washington could return to Cold War levels of hostility and nuclear stockpiling. So our question on Quadriga this week is Trump versus Putin, a new nuclear arms race. And to discuss that question, I'm joined here in the studio by three astute observers and analysts, beginning with Berlin-based paediatrician Alex Rosen who's president of the German section of the organization International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And Dr. Rosen says a new nuclear arms race has already begun. Nuclear weapons are incompatible with international humanitarian law and should be banned. Also with us is Eric Kirschbaum, author and journalist who writes for the Los Angeles Times. He asks all those people in Western Europe who are so worried about a renewed nuclear arms race, where have they been since 2008 when Russia started testing cruise missiles in violation of the INF? And a very warm welcome too to Andrea Shalal, senior correspondent with Reuters News Agency, where she focuses on security and defense issues. And Andrea believes that President Trump's decision is emblematic of his confrontational style of politics, but it also has to do with growing unease about China and other countries that were never part of the treaty. Thank you all three for being here on Quadriga today. I'd like to begin with you, Andrea. Mm -hmm. And I would like to ask you whether you're, you sleep just a little bit less restfully these last couple of days since President Trump's announcement that he's going to scrap the INF treaty. Absolutely. I mean, I think that we're in a, a, a situation now where so many of the institutions that have shaped the post-Cold War era are being uh, called into question. And, uh, and there is a lot of concern all over the world, I think, about the framework uh, that kind of kept nuclear weapons uh, in check being eroded. And, and I, I recognize, really clearly recognize that other that this treaty is outdated and needs to be updated because there's so many other players now mm. that have uh, developed these sort of shorter range and intermediate range uh, missiles, uh, but we, you, you know, it, it doesn't seem like the right thing to be doing to be backing away from such an important treaty. Alex Rosen, given what Andrea is saying, <clears throat> is that, and I, I don't mean this question friv frivolously at all, is it time now to start building bunkers in the garden as people not so long ago once actually did? Well, we are seeing, in fact, um, a return to some of the Cold War uh, dynamics to the Cold War rhetorics mm -hmm. on both sides of the of the Atlantic, and this is extremely worrying for us here in Germany, here in Europe, because we know that in the case of a military um, military confrontation between the U.S. and Russia, this is going to take place here in Europe, and that was the reason why in the 1980s there were hundreds of thousands of people in Germany, in Europe protesting against the deployment of, uh, of these intermediate-range uh, nuclear missiles and for uh, Europe that is safer without these missiles. And to go back to that time just seems like an absolute folly at this time where we are moving towards a more insecure and unsafer world. What we need right now is not less peace and security architecture, not less international treaties, but more. And we would actually need the leaders of Russia and US to sit down at a table and discuss the problems they each have with the INF treaty. Both of them are accusing each other of violating the treaty. Mm -hmm. But this needs to be discussed in negotiations and not through threats or ultimatums. Eric Kirschbaum, how serious is the situation? The New York Times says that people in Europe and the United States are calling it a Cold War that has already begun to emerge. Is that panic talk? Well, I mean, I think the Cold War began in 2014 with Crimea, so you can go back a bit further. In 2008, Russia started installing these cruise missiles in Western Europe as well, so the, the treaty has sort of been not really enforced for quite a while now. I mean, I sleep just as well now as I did a, a week or two ago. I have no problem sleeping. I don't feel any more afraid now. I think Trump is a very transactional character, a pre transactional president. He likes to do deals. I think this is the first lob in a, in a negotiation process that will probably lead to a new INF treaty with China this time. 
China wasn't a player 30 years ago. China's a very big player now. So I think this is just an opening lob in Trump's game to get a deal. He loves deals. He wants to do a deal with both China and Russia. He's not canceling the treaty. He's talking about canceling it. This is a process that will take a long time. I don't think people need to start building their bunkers yet. You've got a why, year or two why time. Is it, why has he come out? Why now? Uh, he's been, been told by his advisors for a long time that Russia's been violating the treaty. Obama wanted, was telling Russia, you're violating the treaty. NATO has talked about this as well. This is, just, this is not just a Trump thing. I know in Germany people like to jump on Trump and criticize him for everything that happens, but this has been going on for a while. Obama also raised these same issues, perhaps with different language. Obama was considering scrapping it as well. It's not just Trump. Okay. I, I, I think um, it's important to say that the U.S. military has had growing concerns about Chinese military uh, activities for many years now. Um, I think around 2007, the Chinese destroyed a satellite outside of uh, U.S. Uh, outside of the, the Earth's orbit, and that was uh, a real wake-up call because it, it demonstrated. Uh, a, a, a tendency on the part of the Chinese and, and really a doctrine to develop weapon systems of all kinds that could be used to assert Chinese um, power. And I, really, since that time, there has been growing concern um, in, in the U.S. Uh, particularly. Um, and that, you know, that rhetoric, uh, or rather the discussion and the concerns about the INF Treaty also come, it came in that period afterwards. So it's really not just about Russia's violations. It's also about this deep-seated concern that U.S. Um, military advisors have uh, that they you know, backed out of a treaty, or with the treaty basically backed away from the development efforts, mm -hmm. but that other countries were not bound by that. And so it's China and Iran and, and Korea and other countries have been working on these weapon systems that could be very dangerous indeed and need to be brought into a treaty. The question is whether the kind of, you know, stamp your foot and big stick policy is the right way to get to a treaty that encompasses more signatories. I completely agree, and I think we're making two fundamental mistakes in this in this discourse, in this debate internationally. The first is we're, we're again back to playing the blame game. Russia is accusing the US of breaking or violating the spirit of the treaty by installing anti-ballistic missiles around Russia, also in Poland and in, in Romania, land-based missiles that could also break the INF, whereas the US is accusing Russia of combining land-based uh, missile launchers with intermediate uh, nuclear nuclear missiles. And uh, while there's no actual proof of any violation, there is definitely the situation that we all feel that both countries are not acting in the spirit of this agreement. So what we should be doing instead of playing the blame game is we should be looking towards solutions. What are the possibilities to salvage and to improve this important piece of security architecture? And the second mistakes that I think a lot of us are making in, in discussing this topic is we're looking at this problem solely from a military strategic point of view. Who has a right to, according to which treaty, to place which kinds of weapons of mass destruction where? Whereas we should be looking at it from the point of view of humanitarian law, which clearly states that a, an, a type of weapon that was designed to target a civilian population is in clear violation of international humanitarian law, of the Geneva Conventions, and should be banned. And this is the process that, that the world is in right now um, to, to actually get this nuclear um, weapons ban treaty that was issued in, in 2017 ratified and get it uh, to, to become active and uh, to work with it and not to go back to a world where countries were threatening each other with the use of weapons of mass destruction against the opposing civilian population. Okay, many people argue that the INF Treaty is obsolete and has uh, been so for a long time, but for most Europeans it's the cornerstone of their security. Let's go back a little bit in time. By the late 1980s, the Cold War was winding down. In 1987, US President Ronald Reagan and his Soviet counterpart Mikhail Gorbachev signed the so-called INF Treaty. It banned both sides from owning and constructing land-based intermediate-range nuclear-armed missiles with a range of between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. The nuclear arms race was finally over. And two years later, the Berlin Wall fell. 
Though several years earlier and despite widespread public opposition, new intermediate-range nuclear-armed missiles had been deployed in Europe as part of NATO's 1983 double-track decision. This determined stance, from a Western perspective, was needed to force Russia to agree to nuclear disarmament. But is the INF Treaty still fit for purpose? No, I think we've already agreed that. But is it, Alex Rosen, a case now of finessing the treaty or is it a case for you of, of banning nuclear weapons altogether? Well, I don't think it's one or the other. We have a very complex architecture of security here in Europe that has developed over time and has ensured that nuclear weapons have not been used in Europe. Um, and this, is, this was the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which the US left uh, in 2001. This uh, is the INF Treaty. Uh, we have the OECD. We have the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty. And all of these treaties play a vital role. But that does not mean that they are um, the, the final goal of nuclear abolition. What we really need is the realization that nuclear weapons, per definition, violate humanitarian law. And that just as we've done with other weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological weapons, landmines, cluster ammunition, there needs to be an international agreement to um, get rid of these nuclear weapons. And this does not happen overnight. It takes a lot of confidence building. It takes a lot of um, uh, intermediate steps. And getting out of a vital part of the security architecture here in Europe is definitely not the right way towards a world where it becomes possible to negotiate about reducing and abolishing nuclear weapons. This is what we must see, regardless of how we view the INF as a treaty. Andrea. I just wanted to say that I think that we are in a, an environment where, uh, you know, uh, Eric just said that President Trump is very transactional. So the, the question is, what forms of leverage exist, right? So, um, both Russia and China are have they have tremendous economic problems coming at them. The Chinese economy is slowing. Russia has had uh, many, many financial issues that are, are starting to really bear fruit and, and, and are starting to result in some protests even against Putin. Um, <clears throat> so perhaps the 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 savvier thing to do would be to sit down at a table with the leaders of Russia and China and to say, look, you know, the global economy is a problem. You know, there in, could be a dip. In, instead, let's, Eric, let's it's make being it... argued that Donald Trump has walked into a trap, that he has suggested scrapping the... the well, he's given the Russians the excuse for saying it was them. They scrapped the, they scrapped the agreement. Yeah, I mean, as he said, there's going to be a blame game going around, but what, what he described is a very utopian world. It would be nice to say, OK, no more nuclear weapons, and the, the Russians will dis dismantle all theirs, the Americans, and the... And the it, but it's not going to happen in our lifetime anyway. I don't think that's going to happen, that we're going to be scrapping nuclear weapons everywhere, unfortunately. Um, they're here to stay. They're going to be here. And um, I think there's a lot of people in the United States agree totally with Trump. You have to be tough with, with the Russians. You, you cannot just let them violate the treaty for eight years or 10 years and do nothing about it. Um, as, as I mentioned before, this has been talked about for a long time in the US, you know, and letting them go on by, by violating the treaty with no consequence, it just wasn't gonna work anymore. I think we're in the, in the nuclear abolition movement, we're used to um, the, 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 the word naive when we're talking about our, our uh, utopian ideas of a nuclear free world. But what we must always say is it is, equally naive, if not more naive, to believe that the status quo of hoping that no country uses nuclear weapons, of hoping that no accident happens, no hacker um, reaches into the nuclear launch codes, and that um, all governments are always sane and all military commanders are always responsible in their use with nuclear weapons, that this will continue forever. We see that in the past, during the Cold War, there have been several dozens incidents where the world came very, very close to nuclear annihilation. And the, if you ask the people responsible back then, the militaries, the politicians, they unequivocally all agree that it was luck and divine intervention, as they call it, that nothing happened. So this is not um, a system that we can rely on for future security. Either we get rid of nuclear weapons or they get rid of us. And the question we must ask ourselves, what's the realistic, the most practical and realistic step-by-step -step approach towards a world free of nuclear weapons. And we believe that just 
as was the case with other weapons of mass destruction, we must first create an environment and a public discourse that views these weapons for what they are, weapons of mass destruction that violate humanitarian law. And then we can begin discussing who is actually profiting from these nuclear weapons, which companies are producing them, which banks are funding these, um, these, um, these companies, which governments are using and deploying nuclear weapons, and uh, how is their population viewing this? And there's a, a huge majority in all of the nuclear weapon states that oppose the continued use of nuclear weapons. So we should approach the pr problem from, um, from an activist, from a civil society point of view, and really talk about human security and not about military options for using weapons of mass destruction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all sounds really good, but I just, I, I just don't see it happening. I, what, what body is going to lead this? The UN, um, the veto powers, there's always the veto at the UN Security Council. It just isn't going to happen, is it? What is going to happen? Hopefully there'll be some, uh, they'll sit down and there'll be a new INF treaty with China involved and it'll be another 30 years or 20 years of, of relative security. This is actually Hopefully. a real opportunity for Europe though. I mean, it's an opportunity for Europe to get unified around something that is very near and dear to the heart of the Europeans because we're talking about shorter and medium intermediate range missiles that could reach Europe. I mean, that was why the INF treaty was negotiated in the first place because, or, you know, because it was so it was so much in Europe's interest. So Europe, if it could finally unify around some issue, could act as a kind of a counterweight to say to, you know, okay guys, let's have a reasonable discussion about this and let's work out something that includes all of the threat, the, these, these threats. Mm -hmm. You said hopefully, and this is exactly the point. I think it's, it's very telling that the people who are promoting or applauding the step to get out of the INF uh, by, by the US government are always saying, well, we hope that afterwards we will sit down with the Chinese. We hope that something better will come along. We hope the Russians will react this way. Whereas I think the more responsible approach from leaders and from a strategist should be to really sit down and think, what is realistic? How can we realistically negotiate a better treaty? And um, what, what, what we feel needs to happen, you said Europe needs to, to come together. I think also the German government has a very big responsibility to play because we um, host nuclear weapons here on our soil, US American um, nuclear weapons, 20 of them are, uh, are positioned here in, in, in Büchel Air Base, and we are part of NATO, we're part of the uh, nuclear umbrella, and we are part of threatening Russia with the use of nuclear weapons. At the same time, we are being threatened by nuclear weapons. So we have a role to play, we have a voice, and the German government should not stick to its previous position that as part of NATO and the nuclear umbrella, we always have to oppose Russia and we have to show strength, but to act as an intermediate between but the, the two nuclear powers. the problem is the nuclear... I think, Andrea. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I think, I think Germany has had that intermediary role and, and has tried to preserve it, you know, and is really at odds with the U.S. government on a number of issues, including, for instance, the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline project, which... I, from a German perspective, is a critical element of that policy of continued engagement with Russia. So I would say that the German government, however effectively, has, con has really tried to keep the door open for dialogue, both with Russia and with China, in trying to sort of continue to be, be able to play a role as a, as a sort of a mediator, if you will. Um, the, the question is, what structure can that conversation take place in? And that's where it's really, you know, it's incumbent upon those countries that are the biggest players that have the biggest stick to get over, jump over their shadows and get down and sit down and, and get down to business and do it. But the thing is, we're, I mean, for the past decades, we've always talked about the nuclear weapon states as the ones who have the responsibility to solve these problems, while ignoring that the entire world's population and the, the other 185 countries also have a vital stake because they are the ones that will be affected by a nuclear war. And what ICANN, what the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons has done for the first time is to give these countries a voice and to look not only towards the nuclear weapon states for solutions, but to look at the multi, uh, multilateral organizations like the United Nations for leadership 
and for the countries affected by a nuclear war uh, to step up and say, we are no longer prepared to be bullied and to um, be pressured by the nuclear weapon states who are saying they need nuclear weapons for their own security, but we would not become safer with nuclear weapons. So this argument just does not hold. No country in the world becomes safe through nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons threaten the security of the world. Does okay. it take a but, shock? Yeah, but just, just before we continue, let's go, let's go back a little to uh, what Presidents Trump and Putin have actually been saying in the last couple of days, and then we can continue this, the discussion about who's leading this, uh, this issue. Speaking in Nevada, Trump threatened that his government would again start developing intermediate-range nuclear missiles if Russia does not agree to a new treaty. We're the ones that have stayed in the agreement, and we've honored the agreement, but Russia has not, unfortunately, honored the agreement. So we're going to terminate the agreement. We're going to pull out. But President Putin countered that NATO's missile defense site in Romania could easily be used to launch U.S. nuclear-armed cruise missiles. This way, the U.S. is in fact leading to the destruction of the Intermediate-Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. They are constantly searching for some violations from our side and are consistently doing it themselves, the same way as they had consistently worked on leaving the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Trump versus Putin. A new showdown in Europe? Trump versus Putin, Eric, and uh, the Chinese in the equation as well. How are they going to be brought together, these three antagonists? Uh, presumably their own self-interest. I mean, I think all three countries are enjoying the fruits of the prosperity of the world trade, and, and they'll, they'll want to work together. I mean, you mentioned earlier uh, people are applauding Trump pulling out of the INF. I don't think anybody applauded. I think people understand why the U.S., after so many years of violations, is threatening to pull out and talking to pull out because Trump wants a new deal. He wants an updated, modern deal that reflects the reality of 2018 and 1987. Um, mm. Is it going to happen anytime soon? I mean, we're talking about the two gentlemen now meeting November the 11th in Paris. Well, look back a year or so ago, all the fears about South Korea, North Korea, with the missiles being launched there, and everybody thought Trump was, uh, was out of his mind. And all of a sudden, they're talking, and they're not shooting the missiles anymore. I mean, Trump is a whole different kind of character, has a whole different style. Um, give him a chance. I mean, sometimes his unorthodox way of getting deals and getting conversations and negotiating do lead, to, do lead to results. In the United States, he's extremely popular right now. It's just in the U.S. for a few weeks, and there are states he's doing really, really well. The blue wave that everybody was predicting for the midterms is disappearing. Mm -hmm. the, the Senate is going to probably stay in Republican hands, perhaps even the House. It's a real shock. Um, so Trump's policies work, and sometimes he is successful. The economy is booming. Unemployment is a 50-year low. Um, give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Andrea, is this, is, this, is this a rerun of NAFTA with Trump, first of all, saying I'm pulling out and then I'm renegotiating a rerun of what's happened on the Korean Peninsula with threats being made and then negotiations beginning? Are we seeing all that again? Is that the... I think that is sort of the approach, but we haven't seen that happen, for instance, on the Climate Change Treaty, where he did pull out. And on the Iran deal, it's taken a very long time to sort of move on to the next step. It's just not happened yet. What, um, you know, again, I think that, you know, a, a strong... Europe could could really help in this case, and you know I think a lot of people around the world are waiting for the chancellor here. You talk for... about a strong Europe, but Europe appears to many it's been a word that's been used in recent days quite often. Europe appears helpless, mm. faced with the current situation. Europe, yeah. Europe, Europe seems like a potential battlefield, but not much more in the current, current debate. But this really is, and it could be an opportunity. I mean, sometimes politics works through shocks. So sometimes, you know, in this case, this, this isn't unexpected. I mean, the U.S. has been expected to pull out of the INF Treaty for quite some time. Mm. And uh, it, so there's been a build-up to that. Perhaps what it takes is uh, a recognition that now it is time for another player, in this case, Europe, could be that player to step up and uh, and say, look, now it is time. Let us convene a meeting of these principal players that are involved in these uh, agreements. 
you know, I think sometimes politics takes that shock. And, you know, President Trump has perfected the art of confrontation as a, as a sort of opening salvo for, for negotiation. In this case, I just don't know. A quick answer, Alex Rosen. Is it more likely to be the leaders of Europe, people like Angela Merkel, or the people of Europe taking to the streets who are going to create a new dynamic here? There are a lot of problems right now. In, within the EU and within the European countries, I really feel that... Um, the civil society movements in all of these countries need to support sensible measures towards um, more security in Europe rather than less security. So I do see both as having a responsibility to act. OK, and I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it right there because we've run out of time. We've been discussing today Trump versus Putin, a new nuclear arms race, question mark. Thanks very much for joining us. Come back next week. Bye-bye and tschüss. <laughs>